All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started uh, with this evening's talk. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jeremy Brown. I'm uh, assistant professor here in the Department of Biological Sciences and one of the hosts for our uh, computational biology seminar series for undergrads. Uh, so we're very excited to have our third talk in this fall's installment. Um, and our speaker tonight will be Maheshi uh, Dasanayaka, and she did her PhD and postdoc at the University of Illinois and joined, uh, joined us here at LSU, uh, was it? This year. This year, yeah, that's right, yeah, in January of this year. Uh, so her work is in generally in the area of functional genomics and comparative genomics, and uh, tonight she'll be talking about putting together genomic jigsaw puzzles and decoding the messages in a genome, so. Thank you, Jeremy. Can everybody hear me? And I hope the remote listeners also can hear me clearly. So I'm very excited to be here today, and, and, and thanks, Jeremy, uh, for inviting uh, me to give this talk. And uh, so I'll start with the, the, the title. So here we see two lines. So these are actually two tasks in computational biology, putting together genomes, jigsaw puzzles, and decoding the messages in a genome. These are two uh, biological challenges, computational challenges. And one leads to a bigger challenge once accomplished. The first task, so I'll take the first task and describe how we've applied computational tools in our lab, and then uh, move on to the second task, decoding the genomes, and give a few examples of how we've explored that. Um, so assembling genomes, why is this a challenge? Uh, soon uh, you will see this is a problem of the size. So uh, we'll take a few examples from uh, sample genomes. So first, the E. coli genome, the model bacterium genome, and the size is about uh, 4.5 million base pairs. Base pairs. So 4.5 million, that's still million bases. But compared to uh, eukaryotic genomes, this is pretty small. You can fit the entire genome of uh, E. coli into one chromosome of Arabidopsis thaliana genome. Now, if any of you are hearing Arabidopsis thaliana, the name, for the first time here, just think of it as, as the uh, mouse model in the plant kingdom. So plant biologists, plant, plant molecular biologists, geneticists use this as the model genome to uh, study uh, plant uh, processes. And E. coli genome, like I said, is, uh, you can fit the entire genome in one chromosome of Arabidopsis, but Arabidopsis genome is not a big genome. You'll see soon, if you compare here with the human genome, you can fit the entire Arabidopsis genome in one chromosome, actually one chromosome arm of uh, chromosome one in the human genome. Now, that doesn't end there. You, all plant genomes are not small uh, like Arabidopsis. You have giant plant genomes too. So if you take the pine genome, you can fit one, uh, the entire human uh, genome in one chromosome of the pine genome. So the, where is the pine genome? so the scale quickly goes to orders of magnitudes uh, higher with each genome. And uh, sequencing all this is a huge challenge. But just because this is big, why is this a challenge? Uh, because we know the size of these genomes. This is 35 billion base pairs. This is 3.2 billion, again, 130 million. So now we're in the million scale here. But why is this really a challenge? Why? Because the sequencing technologies today are limited in the size of how much we can sequence at a stretch. So a continuous sequence molecule is limited to mostly 100 base pairs with today's high throughput sequencing uh, technologies and with the platforms like nanopore sequencing or pack bio sequencing, you can go up to lengths like 10 kb. But still, this is order of magnitude less than a small bacterial genome. And if you imagine, if we want to sequence these genomes, these are pretty small lengths. So we have a serious limitation of the length we can sequence. This is what we want to sequence, the length. This is what we can today. And there's a huge gap. 
but there's some, so we are not so great at uh, sequencing really long se uh, DNA molecules, but we are good at something else here. That is the quantity. Although we can, can sequence very long sequences, we can do lots of short sequences. We can do billions and millions of short sequences very easily with today's technology. And with, coupled with very um, uh, high amounts of sequencing with short reads, you can try and assemble almost any genome that any organism you can find on Earth today. And uh, so assembling genomes is uh, analogous to assembling uh, or putting together the, uh, jigsaw puzzle. And uh, so your starting material for a jigsaw puzzle would be a nice picture like this, right? For a computational biologist doing this work, your starting material is some white fuzzy stuff that called genomic DNA. And I'm sure most of you have extracted DNA in high school labs or your introductory genetics classes or even science fairs. Most of you come across this white fuzzy stuff that we call DNA, right? So this is the same stuff we use to sequence large genomes. So the, whatever the organism you want, you get the genomic DNA. And that's your starting material. But we can't read there. This is the biological material, but we want it in a human readable format. And a human readable format, the material for our jigsaw puzzle, the puzzle pieces, are these sequences. So this is huge text files of long sequences. Short sequences, but lots of those. And then our goal is to put these sequences together in a chromosome map where every sequence we sequence, we know where it comes from in the, in the chromosome. So in the chromosome map, we are putting all this together in a continuous molecule that we can call a genome. And a genome, if, um, if you're wondering uh, whether this is just a collection of all the genes found in a genome, genome is not just that. It's everything, all the genetic material in, your, uh, in an organism. So, it includes genes and lots of repeat sequences, non-coding sequences, and mostly in uh, eukaryotic genomes, uh, the component for genes is less than 1%. Everything else is non-coding, repeat, uh, other unidentified genome, uh, genetic material. So all of this we get when we sequence this stuff. So we need to put this in the chromosome map. And to accomplish this, we don't start with just one copy in a, in a regular jigsaw puzzle. You start with just one and then end up with that. But here, you start with thousands of copies of your genome, break this apart, get this, and try to get this at the end. So that's the, the task ahead. Now, um, uh, bef uh, before I go into specific examples of how we've accomplished this in our group, I'll uh, give you a bit more detail about the cool machine that can do this. So again, the uh, white uh, uh, the, uh, genomic DNA here, uh, the machine gives you this. So from this biological material, the human readable information, how do you get to this step? First, you break this into millions of pieces. Uh, you can't just take one string of DNA at a time and then start sequencing. These are too long to sequence. So you break it into small pieces and then uh, put handles to these sequences. So the handles we call adapters. So the adapters will uh, let us manipulate these sequences to attach them to platforms and then sequence. So we break the, uh, the genomic DNA and then add the adapters. And then we put these adapters into a chip we call a flow cell. So I'm talking mainly about the Illumina uh, sequencing platform here. There are other sequencing platforms which uh, uh, differs in their sequencing chemistry, but Illumina is uh, uh, the most popular, the most widely used sequencing platform and something that we've extensively used in our lab. So I'm going to uh, tell a bit about the sequencing strategy with the Illumina platform. So in this flow cell, 
this flow cell is about this size, a few centimeters. And it's got, um, it's got several uh, layers, actually eight layers. And this width of this one lane is about one millimeter, 1.4 millimeter. So this is a tiny chip. When you think of how much you can sequence here, you can get up to 200 billion reads. 200 billion reads of 100 base pair length in this tiny chip. And how uh, does this machine do this? And I'm going to simplify this uh, quite a lot. So with these DNA sequences, these gray parts are the ones that we want to know the sequence. We add the adapters. So we have the handles to them. And these adapters are so versatile that they can get uh, glued onto this flow cell here. And in the flow cell, it's not just a, 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 no, a plain platform. It's got millions of oligos or DNA sequences that we know the sequence of that will stick to the adapters. So the adapters on one end will stick to these protruding DNA sequences that are placed on this chip. And then on the other hand, at the end of this uh, adapter, you have this uh, sequence we want. Now we have these sequences all glued in possibly 200 billion positions in this flow cell, where we can start uh, sequencing from one end to the other. So once you have this all attached into these oligos on the flow cell, uh, uh, DNA polymerase, the enzyme that uh, can create uh, a DNA molecule from another uh, DNA molecule using that as a template, uh, will come and walk through these sequences. At the end of this oligo, you will have the adapter, and at and the, ad the end of that adapter, you have the unknown sequences. So you will sequence all of these that are attached here. And every time a DNA polymerase adds a new nucleotide, that's adding one new nucleotide, a camera, CCD camera takes a picture. And if your sequence is 100 base pair length, the camera will take a picture every time a, sequence, a nucleotide is added, and then stacks pictures of uh, the sequencing run, one on top of the other. And then, with computational tools, each of these positions through 100 slides will have a new sequence, a nucleotide added in, with every sequential picture that's being added. So every position here is unique, and that unique position will have a sequence that every time the, uh, the, the DNA polymerase uh, adds a nucleotide, the camera takes a picture, and you record what, uh, what base was added. And there will be four different uh, lights emit, uh, light signals emitted for the four different bases, A, T, C, G. So at the end, what you sequence is these clusters of light signals emitted every time uh, new bases are added. And based on that, the machine then interprets what the light signal means. Each light signal gets a base. And if you can't interpret the light signal, it will give an end. And then you have this converted to human readable uh, ATCG. Now, at this end of uh, one flow cell run with single end sequences, you end up with 3 billion reads. Now, the, the bigger challenge becomes how do you put these into a chromosome? These are now just fragmented representation of your genome. And that's not very useful if you're actually trying to understand what's happening in the, in the genome and uh, the functional uh, aspect of the genome. That, this wouldn't help. So before, uh, before I uh, talk about um, how we uh, put together uh, the, so from here to here, how we got these sequences into uh, a chromosome map. I'll first uh, introduce you to the target genome that I'm going to talk about, uh, a, a plant in this family called Brassicaceae. 
Now I will get to the genome assembly, but before that, which genome to sequence and why we picked that genome. So this uh, Brassicaceae family, or we call this also Crucifer family, because this uh, flower looks like a cross. So it's called the cross-bearing flower, Crucifer family. And this is uh, one of the, the biggest plant families. And it's also very important if you think of uh, the, the species that are found in this family. Uh, all the vegetable crops from cabbage to cauliflower, uh, Brussels sprouts, uh, uh, kale, collard, everything is in this family. And also our model plant, Arabidopsis. Remember, if you think of all the plant genomes, uh, all uh, uh, plants used for molecular biology, the most of the information we know is from this plant. And this plant is also in this Brassicaceae family. But the target uh, species I'm going to talk mostly today is this one here. It's called uh, Telangula parvula. I will call it parvula for the rest of the talk, or I might refer it to the genus Telangela. But why are we interested in these, uh, these plants? Is that te in the Telangela genus, you find uh, crucifer plants that are highly adapted to abiotic stress. So uh, all the plants um, that are highly adapted to high salt, high light, uh, drought, uh, poor nutrient uh, conditions, all the, in, uh, the, the poor environmental conditions for normal plant growth, these are champions, champions in tolerating those abiotic stresses. And for that biological reason, we, are in, we were interested in uh, sequence of genome of this plant. And uh, so I said these were extremely tolerant to abiotic stress, but let's, let me take you to where these plants are found. So this uh, particular plant called Telangela parvula, this grass-like plant, it's not a grass, uh, it grows in uh, salt uh, flats in central Turkey. And this salt lake is called Lake Tas. Lake Tas in Turkish means salt. Tas is uh, salt. So this is a very extreme, harsh environment for regular plants. But this one, among other plants, will grow nicely in the shows that are extremely difficult conditions for normal crop plants. And we wanted to get the, the, the sequence of genome of this plant. And first, we want to see the size of the genome. Because remember from the first slide, size is important. So if we are going for a really big genome, then we should be prepared to have really difficult task in assembling this. Now, this one is relatively small compared to lots of other plant genomes. This, the Arabidopsis plant, uh, genome has uh, uh, 10 chromosomes. The haploid number is 5. This one has 14 chromosomes, uh, uh, more than Arabidopsis, but the genome size is comparable to Arabidopsis, slightly bigger than Arabidopsis, but more or less the same size as Arabidopsis. And what we did was uh, break the, uh, the genomic DNA into small pieces and different sizes of pieces. And also we used to sequence the pieces from both ends. So we could sequence from this end and this end. And we have different sizes of 3, 8, and 15 kb. And also, we used uh, two different sequencing platforms, one Illumina, one 454. Um, uh, so the, in this uh, Illumina sequencing, what we did was chop this up and massively sequence just the short reads in one direction. And in here, it's bigger pieces, but both ends. And then what? Uh, a few more uh, things that we uh, used uh, to uh, make our assembly strategy more, uh, more straightforward was we used the inbred line. So uh, inbred line means that the, the, the parents of these plants, uh, this is coming from a single line uh, of, uh, 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 of plants. So in a diploid organism, you could think of two sets of chromosomes, one coming from the mother, one coming from the father. 
and they could have potentially two different uh, genetic information. But in an inbred line, you self the plant, you, you fertilize with, with the same, same uh, genetic material from the plant. And with several successive generations, your genetic information from both sets of the chromosomes become uh, identical. So your heterogeneity in this uh, initial genomic uh, DNA is very less if you use inbred lines. Now this one, you can do this for most plants, but for animals, you, ca you can't, for most uh, genomes, you can't use this strategy, but for plants, you can. And we did hybrid sequencing because we used two different platforms. And we also did single end and paired end sequencing. And we used a hierarchical assembly strategy using different uh, uh, assembly methods. And what we ended up getting was reducing 8 billion reads into uh, 1,500 continuous DNA molecules, further reduced into 37 very long non-gap molecules that represented seven chromosomes in the genome. Uh, in 50 value, this is a measure of how uh, good or how contiguous the genome is. It's about 5.29 million bases. So what this value means is that we have put together 8 billion reads and most of it is at least 5.29 million bases long without any gaps. So in our jigsaw puzzle, we reduce the complexity from 8 billion reads the, to um, uh, very long sequences of um, 1,500 uh, uh, lengths of sequences that are at least million bases long. And these 8 billion reads are mostly 100 to 300 um, bases long. So 100 bases long into 4.29 billion bases long. Now, uh, from there, how do you get it into a chromosome map? Now, we wanted to uh, put these lo very long sequences into a, a genetic map or a chromosome map. For that, we actually looked at the chromosome or the genome evolution of uh, uh, Brassicaceae. And in Brassicaceae, you could think of an ancestral chrom uh, chromosome map or a karyotype where you have eight chromosomes. And with uh, Arabidopsis, you have five chromosomes. And the, in the plant we are interested in, it's got seven chromosomes here. In this ancestor karyotype, so Parvula and Arabidopsis at one time shared a common ancestor. And that common ancestor had eight chromosomes. And this happened about eight million years ago. So in this uh, projected model, big chromosomal pieces moved around to give the five chromosomes that we see today in Arabidopsis. And it moved in a different direction and gave the, the model we have for our target species. And you could think of these like plate tectonics, big chromosomes moving in the genome, ancestral genome, giving different structures and giving two different uh, identities for these genomes. And uh, it, within 8 million years, we've accumulated so many differences with these huge movements of chromosomes in these two species. And with that information, we could take our long assembled DNA sequences and see where these map in the Arabidopsis genome. Now, the Arabidopsis genome was done in 2002, and this is the most complete plant genome available to date. And if you put Arabidopsis chromosome 1, 2, 4, and uh, 3, and 4, sorry, 5, 3, and 4, 5 here, because I want to get these straight here. But the Arabidopsis genome on, uh, on here, and then try to align the sequences that we have assembled. In this example, you see that this piece of chromosome R here and W here in Arabidopsis should be at two ends of chromosome 5. But in the model for parvula, they should come together, W and R next to each other. And we have a contiguous, non-gapped, solid sequence of DNA 
here in our assembly that maps to two different places in chromosome 5 in Arabidopsis. Okay, another example. If you uh, take uh, these blocks, K, L, Q, V, and X, these are large chromosomal blocks that are found in three different chromosomes in five different places in Arabidopsis. They all come together in the second chromosome in uh, Pabula. And we have a config, again, an, a non-gapped contiguous sequences, sequence showing, proving the model that we have assembled this correctly. And with that, we could put all our long sequences, all the 37 contigs, into a chromosome map to get this new genome assembled. Now, this is like a new book put together that has not been read until now. This has got all the, the messages or codes inside it that makes this plant uh, uh, that makes this plant so tolerant to all the abiotic stress and makes it uh, a successful plant growing in this particular niche. And all the signatures of that success is in, embedded in this sequence. And that's, uh, that's what the biological question we are interested in uh, uh, trying to understand in our group. So we've accomplished this task and moving on to this task. Uh, this task. So this is a, a challenge in itself, but this creates a bigger challenge in this section. Uh, how do you understand the, the new genome? So if this is a new book that no one has read. Now, from the work done on the model plant, Arabidopsis, we know that the Pavula genome has, is very similar to the Arabidopsis genome because these are closely related species only separated through eight to uh, about maximum 12 million years ago. So these are substantially similar. They share the common ancestor uh, ten, uh, eight to 12 million years ago. But with current day, uh, how these plant, two plants are growing, these are highly different plants. But the genomes still share lots of similarities and there should be some differences. We don't know anything about this red circle, but we know a lot with the, about this blue circle. But so how do we use the genetic information in the genome space for Arabidopsis to understand this new uh, uh, genome? And that's a uh, second task, how to decode the genome and how to read this book. And then understand why this is so different from our model plan. Now, before we look for differences, we should first establish the similarities. And here, what we've done is align the two genomes, the Arabidopsis genome from chromosome 1 to 5, align to Parvula chromosomes 1 to 7. Remember, Arabidopsis is 5 chromosomes, Parvula is 7 chromosomes. And the first thing you will notice is that there are lots of solid lines, big color blocks. These are all the similar regions between these genomes. And these are called collinear or synthetic gene uh, regions. And there is high synteny, or these are highly collinear genomes. And then if this is so similar to Arabidopsis, where do the differences lie? Now for that, you need to zoom into the genome and see what are the differences. If there are big basic similarities, where do the differences lie? Now here, what we've done here is get a chunk of uh, the, the Pavula genome, a 50 KB sequence, and align that to the homologous or the uh, analogous sequence in Arabidopsis genome. So there are several genes, and all these genes are paired one to one between this orange uh, Pavula line and blue um, Arabidopsis line. But in some places, you don't see this one to one match in this case. Here, this blue gene, if you look at the uh, synthetic region in Parvula, you have this duplication of this gene. So this is a tandem duplication because this one is directly copied one after the other next to each other. That's called a tandem duplication. And in this case, this gene, this gene doesn't have a corresponding partner on this side. 
But if you search for this sequence throughout the genome of Arabidopsis, you will find the, uh, the homologous uh, sequence in chromosome 2. This is chromosome 1 in Arabidopsis. This is chromosome 1 in Parvula. But the homologous sequence for this one is found in chromosome 2. So the place is not matching. This uh, in Arabidopsis seemed to be taken out and inserted in Parvula. And this is the event we call translocation. And now these translocation and tandem duplication events, in addition to uh, retrotransposable uh, insertions, disrupt the synteny that we see in the large scale. So now again, uh, we know that there are some similarities. We know there are some differences. But what might these differences be, uh, what, what are these differences telling us? Or what can we first guess before we actually interpret what the genomic differences tell us? So for that, we'll go back to where Pavula is found, its native habitat, Lake Tus. Lake Tus, the, the Google image picture, is all uh, white stuff, east salt. And this is uh, taken during summer when the lake is dried up, so you have a salt crust farming on, over the lake, and parvula is growing in the shores, and still really extremely high uh, salt levels. And parvula grown and put seeds up here in this picture. So if this is growing under high salt levels, one, qui uh, one first guess you may have is that this should have genes that uh, can uh, transport or uh, respond to lots of salt based on where it's coming from, right? So does it, can it really grow under, so the salt ha lake has very high levels of uh, so, uh, different li types of ions, lithium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and also borates and sulfates. But the soils might have varying different uh, uh, levels of salt. So we want to test in the lab whether parvul actually can grow under these high salts. And uh, here we are growing parvula next to Arabidopsis. So Arabidopsis uh, and parvula, same age. This is six weeks old, flowering, and without any stress. But if you give uh, 200 millimolar sodium chloride, so the stress is introducing sodium here, at four weeks, this will die in two to three days. This will keep growing and put flowers. And same story with these ions. High potassium, Arabidopsis, our model plant, dies. This keeps growing and fruit flowers. High lithium, Arabidopsis is dead. Parvula is growing and putting out flowers. Same story, magnesium, Arabidopsis is long dead. Parvula is growing and uh, putting out seeds. Again, for borate, um, because I've shown lots of cations here, this is uh, for borate, same thing. So indeed, even uh, even the salt uh, the the salt levels of the lake water is high. So is the the soils near the lake, and we can show that, and it is reproducible in the lab too when we grow uh, this plant under high salt. Now, then does this mean that genome structure mirror adaptability or ecological niche and lifestyle, and can you use the genome? to identify what components of the genome makes this a tolerant plant. Now, to, we, we were, up to now we were talking about the genome and trying to understand the parvula genome compared to the Arabidopsis genome. But we want to add another layer of uh, uh, biological information on top of this. And now we want to add uh, the information we get from the transcriptome. I'm sure everybody has gone through this uh, uh, schematic or the cartoon for basic um, uh, transcription machinery from DNA, RNA to protein in your introductory biology classes. So the first level of biological information with sequencing we got at this level, genomic level. But every cell in an organism has the same genome. Every, every cell has the same copy. What is active? is the RNA component that is transcribed from this DNA. So in your genome, there will be dead genes. We call them pseudogenes. There could be inactive genes that are not transcribed in a particular cell. And there could be active, 
active uh, genes and the active genes code for the transcripts that then are later uh, translated into proteins. So uh, maybe you uh, heard Dr. Brilinski talk about high throughput uh, proteomics last time. But uh, for today's talk, I'm touching only these two levels. How can we understand the organism by using the genomic information and the transcriptomic information? And how do we combine these and try to understand the biological processes? So to get the transcriptomes, now this is a busy slide. I don't want you to read everything here. This is just if uh, any grad student would want to look at our RNA-seq pipeline and the, special, the specific programs we use, the, I've mentioned it here, but just think of this as we grew parvula and arabidopsis in the same condition and took roots and shoots and then sequenced the RNA this time, not the genome. Uh, we are looking not at the DNA, we are looking at the RNA to see what's the active component of the genome that we have already assembled. And I'm going to show a series of uh, slides with this uh, concept, so I will walk through uh, the, the meaning of these. Uh, so be, uh, stay with me here. Now here in this blue line, we have the Arabidopsis genome. And here we have the parvula genome. These are homologous regions. So the blue uh, lines are the model genomes here, the reference genomes. And in these gray peaks, what we show is the RNA-seq analysis. So the same way we sequence the DNA, we can sequence RNA and then see what genes are expressed, how much of it is expressed. If these are highly expressed, you have a peak. If these are not expressed, you don't have a peak. So S stands for shoots. So what are the genes active in Arabidopsis AT shoots? What genes are active in Arabidopsis R roots? Similarly, what genes are active in Arab uh, parvula shoots? And what are the genes transcribed or active in parvula roots? And we have this for the whole transcriptome and the whole genome. And when we do that, we can now focus into the differences that I mentioned earlier about tandem duplication and translocation and see if the transcriptome is affected by this rearrangement in the genome level that we saw. So here this red uh, square circles a gene that is coding for a lithium transporter in Arabidopsis. And in this single copy gene, there's not much expression here, right? If you look at the neighboring genes, they have peaks, but this one is hardly expressed. And if you align this to the parvular homologous genomic region, you see three copies of this transporter, and these are highly expressed and differentially expressed between shoots and roots. Now, if you remember, parvular can grow under high lithium, Arabidopsis that cannot. And this lithium transporter, if you overexpress artificially in Arabidopsis, you see Arabidopsis becoming more tolerant, slightly tolerant to lithium. And if you knock this gene out or uh, repress this gene activity in Arabidopsis, the Arabidopsis plant becomes even more sensitive to lithium. Now, what does this tell us? In naturally existing um, variation here with parvula, you have three copies, highly expressed, and this plant is also highly tolerant to lithium. So this is one incident where we see a genomic change, where you have the structural genomic change, one gene triplicated, and also the transcriptome supports that triplication by showing differential expression and significantly differential expression, and that also implies into a phenotype that we can detect at the plant uh, level. And uh, another example here, okay, so this is again just to remind us that in Lake Tus, the lithium levels are very high compared to sea level. This is another salt lake in Turkey, and for comparison, lithium is uh, low here. So, uh, so parvula was also tolerant to sodium, and I'm showing another example where the the candidate gene here we are talking about is called uh, AVP1, 
And uh, this is a very important gene uh, for all plants. In uh, AVP1, if you uh, knock out this gene in Arabidopsis, the Arabidopsis plant dies. But and it, it is important and it is highly expressed in Arabidopsis, shoots and roots. So you have a big peak here. And the homologous region for AVP1 here in parviola is also highly expressed. So that is normal. So it's expected. But in, Arabi, uh, in the parvula genome, you have a, a, a second copy of this one. But the corresponding homologous region in Arabidopsis, it's replaced by a DNA transposon. So what that uh, creates is that a huge transcript copy number exists for AVP1 only for parvula. And parvula is also highly soil tolerant. And in uh, Arabidopsis, is much less. And uh, so if you look at uh, all the other uh, the information that we can take from um, other uh, plant genetic studies done on this uh, gene, this is uh, uh, highly important uh, for st soil stress tolerance studies. And if you overexpress the, this gene in other uh, crops, uh, um, tomato, cotton, or even tobacco, um, those plants become more soil tolerant. So in, in other words, what this tells us is that the naturally soil tolerant species parvula has these two copies that are highly expressed for this thing. And another example with potassium, same story, potassium transported here, one, just one copy in uh, Arabidopsis. In parvula, you have two copies. And another potassium uh, sodium transporter that is uh, highly expressed in roots in uh, Arabidopsis and not in shoots. It's reversed in parvula, so you have high expression in shoots, but uh, not in roots. So these are huge changes that will translate into uh, the final phenotype. Now, one last example of the same uh, similar diagrams where we combine the transcriptome to the genome. Here, this is the uh, putative boron transporter. Now, we know parvula is highly tolerant to boron, and uh, Arabidopsis is not. And we don't know the reason for this, but we have a candidate for this. If you look at the entire transcriptome between uh, parvula and Arabidopsis, one of the biggest changes we see is the overexpression of this BOR5 boron transporter compared to Arabidopsis. In both shoots and roots, this is uh, not really expressed here. It's highly expressed, about 500-fold increase here. And in, uh, in parvula, if you overexpress this, um, there is uh, one study that uh, uh, discusses that if you overexpress this in parvula, uh, Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis becomes borate tolerant. But here, naturally, this is highly expressed. So, what uh, we can take uh, home from this is that just by next generation sequencing, we can get a high quality genome. Uh, and uh, do de novo assembly. De novo assemblies, we did not use any reference to assemble it. We just put together the, the sequences together and then compared it to our reference genome. And then when we compare these two similar genomes, what we can see is that tandem gene duplication and translocation, also transposable elements that I, just, I didn't talk uh, much uh, in this talk, will uh, interrupt the synteny between these species. And the few examples I showed you is for uh, the candidate genes that are associated with lithium, sodium, potassium, and borate tolerance. But if you look at the entire transcriptomes and the genome, you see statistical significance for enrichment of copy number, uh, increase in uh, transport function for parvula and not for Arabidopsis. But I, di I didn't want to go through the tables and graphs uh, where we get the statistical significance data comparing all uh, 28,000 gene models in each genome. But we see that these two genomes are similar, but yet carry these fundamental differences to suit their different lifestyles. And 
so uh, Pavula shows indispensable modifications in a set of genes that although present in most or all plants, enable its extremophile lifestyle. And the key word here is that the genes that we find that are structurally different between the two species are found in all plants. And that makes it more important because if you are thinking of crop improvement, especially with climate change where uh, arable land is decreasing and we have a higher demand for uh, food and energy crops, there's more marginal land that we need to use, and if we want to buy, in, increase uh, productivity, we need to find new ways of what genes are best at those uh, per, uh, particular habitats and at particular environmental kind of conditions. And we have this natural resource to get ideas from the uh, to improve crops. And these are present in all the genes that we find that makes these key changes are not specific to parvula. You find this in all plants. So it's just tweaking to change the expression level or maybe duplicating and getting this uh, done. And the uh, high throughput sequencing assembly and comparative genomics gives us a fast forward method to quickly get to the candidate genes to further test and improve crops. And this was not possible 10 years ago, where you could, you're limited to looking at genomes only on model plants. Now you could get any uh, uh, species, any species because they are biologically interesting, you can pick that and sequence and see what that genome tells us, what's the story behind that genome. And with this parvula plant, we are interested in this evolutionary history of uh, 8 million years where it diverged from the model plant and carried all the signatures that it differed from Arabidopsis to give its uh, uh, lifestyle, uh, the, the, the genome adapted to that lifestyle. And all these messages are hidden in this uh, the, the genome. And it, we, so for today's talk, I focus mainly on genes, but genes make less than 1% of the entire genome. There are so many non-coding sequences, uh, regulatory elements that will add on to this lifestyle signatures of this plant. And in our lab, we are constantly looking and exploring for methods to computationally identify these codes and interpret how they translate into the the, the real plant. Uh, what the plant we see today, we can identify uh, the biological processes. How does the genome make, th make that happen? And that's, uh, that's the goal, uh, uh, one of the main goals in our group. But um, having said that, uh, I, I talked about, uh, I talked about um, mostly plant genomes, but the computational tools we use in the lab are not uh, limited to Plants. They can be used to any uh, study any organism, and I'm going to give a few examples of with uh, some collaborative projects that I'm uh, working with uh, different uh, different labs in uh, biological sciences. And the first example is with uh, Dr. Aaron Smith. He studies uh, adaptations or uh, for phosphorus and um, iron starvation in rice. Uh, and he's looking at epigenetic control of uh, rice genomes. So he sequenced nucleosomes. So this is directly related to epigenetic control of growing under low phosphorus and low iron. And uh, we are looking at how uh, the rice genome changes with these different uh, nutrient level stressors. And with uh, Dr. David Dante, She's looking at uh, yeast mutants that are deficient in uh, transcriptional machinery. Uh, so that, again, more chip-seq and RNA-seq, this is nucleosome-seq. And with Dr. Craig Hart, uh, Drosophila mutants, he's looking at uh, genome sequencing of several lines of Drosophila flies. And we are trying to uh, identify the genes that are responsible for some genetic defects in several lines. 
and we are trying to sequence the whole genome and see where these mutant genes are. And with uh, Dr. Greg Pettis, we are looking at uh, some bacterial transcriptome uh, uh, data where uh, some of his uh, vibrio or cholera uh, bacteria, uh, how do these bacterial colonies change transcriptomes when the environment changes? And that's a lot of RNA-seq work there. And then finally, the, the example I'm giving here is with Dr. Brett Eldred. He's looking at uh, disease outbreaks of uh, uh, very prominent uh, uh, agricultural pests like fall armyworm and cabbage looper. And I'm interested in uh, looking at, so these pests, the, these are in the top 10 uh, USDA pet, uh, pests, uh, high, high risk, uh, highly uh, uh, devastating to crops and these can be naturally controlled with bacula viruses. And once these are infected with bacula viruses, there's this battle between the two transcriptomes. The viral transcriptome will uh, battle with the insect transcriptome. And whoever wins will remain. So if the insect wins, it doesn't get killed. If the virus wins, you kill the insect, but you control the disease. Now, it, it will be cool to see uh, what are the transcriptome dynamics between these two. And I'm putting this uh, uh, just in case that if you are not really interested in plants, the computational tools uh, about transcriptome sequencing, genome sequencing that I talked about doesn't have to be done on plants. Any organism you pick, you have a, 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 you have a use for that. And all these uh, faculty, you might have taken their classes, so you might be uh, working in their lab. So if you didn't know about this school research that's taking place, and if you are really interested in more, knowing more about this, go and talk to them. And maybe if we continue this uh, uh, Comp Bio uh, seminar series uh, in the next semester, maybe they will come and tell their stories, how they used computational tools. Uh, to study all these different biological questions. And with that, I would like to thank the, the team that made uh, all this work possible for me. So first, uh, the team in University of Illinois, and then uh, collaborators in Purdue, University of Arizona, and then Chinese Academy of Science, and then uh, GNU in Korea, and also our current group, uh, Dong Ha Oh, he's, uh, he's, he's done most of the transcriptome work I showed and also the genome annotation work that I, I uh, uh, talked today. And uh, Subaya is another senior sci postdoctoral scientist in the lab. He's looking at several transcriptomes of multiple halophytes uh, from seagrass to salt marsh. Uh, uh, Species, and then this is a, a new under, uh, uh, graduate student, Sarah Davis, and also a new undergrad who joined the lab, started as volunteering uh, uh, for the, the lab, Q. And, uh, and then I will also thank the CCP staff for their tremendous help in setting up uh, and spreading the word for this talk. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you again. So the, the RNA uh, seq samples uh, results I showed you were non-stressed, non-stressed. But we also have the the RNA seq data for stressed uh, salt stress samples. But the examples I showed you were non-stressed. But even without non-stressed conditions, you see the peak differences. That means these genomes are fundamentally prepared. Uh, for stress even before the stress is introduced. And the question I forgot to, for the remote listeners, I forgot to rephrase. Cyan transporters were already found. And we see these same sequences in parvula highly expressed. So we are 
associating the function that was established in crops and model plants to read this new genome in Parvula. But we haven't done the knockout or the overexpression studies in Parvula. Um, which sort of, sort of answers my second question, which is going to be, um, I'm actually a, a mathematician and computer scientist, not biology mm -hmm. or biology. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and I'm hoping to get, if, or I guess to those of us hoping to get into like this sort of field, mm -hmm. um, we're mostly scared that we need to do a lot of cloning and or things and that we'd have no experience in that kind of work. Um, what would you say to that? No, so the, the lot of, uh, a lot of genetic studies that I explained, uh, we didn't do it in our, our lab. And those studies take years and bigger and transporters were already found. And we see these same sequences in Parvula highly expressed. So we are associating the function that was established in crops and model plants to read this new genome in Parvula. But we haven't done the knockout or the overexpression studies in Parvula. Um, which sort of, sort of answers my second question, which is going to be, um, I'm actually a, a mathematician and computer scientist, not biology mm -hmm. or biology. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and I'm hoping to get, if, or I guess to those of us hoping to get into like this sort of field, mm -hmm. um, we're mostly scared that we need to do a lot of cloning and or things and that we'd have no experience in that kind of work. Um, what would you say to that? No, so the, the lot of, uh, a lot of genetic studies that I explained, uh, we didn't do it in our, our lab. And those studies take years and bigger groups, so not a single lab can understand all the functions of every gene in a genome. There are about 30,000 genes and there's no way, even for the model plant, most of the genes, we don't know the real function. So it's, it's a collaborative effect done over decades to identify the actual function of genes through uh, focused uh, reverse genetics or uh, other genetic met uh, molecular biology methods. But what I've demonstrated today is that within a year, you can take a plant nobody knows, but it is interesting. You can take an organism that grows in, uh, that's found in thermal vents in deep sea and sequence that. No one has known what it's doing, or, but it is interesting. It's found in an interesting place. You can take that. You can sequence that. And then you can begin to read this new genome by using what is already known from model organisms and then get this fast forward track of where to go and select the candidate genes for further analysis. So this further analysis part, in our lab, we are doing uh, wet lab experiments. But for the computational part, that's uh, uh, different from, uh, from this uh, actual uh, uh, reverse genetics or forward genetics methods. So these are two things, but what computational biology tools enable us is that this fast forward method to pick these places where we should further look into, which actually took years and decades ago uh, before we had this technology. So when you were examining the uh, transcriptomes, mm -hmm. uh, Fangulisa and Rabidopsis, um, I'm assuming, so you were looking at the ion transporter, those salt genes. Right. Um, so I'm assuming you were, you got those from Arabidopsis and then from sequence homology identified them in the Fengulungsa uh, genome. Right. Um, so uh, those chromosomal rearrangements, were there places where you had to go from different chromosomes to look at, uh, say, like chromosome 1 and 7 to compare it to chromosome 1 in Arabidopsis? And yes, yes. So, so you align the the two genomes, and then, uh, so for the most part, there are big sequence similarities, so you easily annotate what's in Arabidopsis. If you have this very high sequence similarity in Parvula, you assign the same function that you know from Arabidopsis. But then, once you do that, you have annotated all the genes possible in Parvula, and then you go back and align and then see where these are, and there at different places. So if there is translocation events, these translocation events in the genome happen due to this cut and paste or copy and paste activity of transposable elements. So there are DNA sequence elements that can go in 
uh, copy a sequence and then extract that sequence and put it in another place in the genome. So the genome is not a, a, a static thing. It's highly dynamic. We are just looking at snapshots of what's happening today. It's been changing rapidly and uh, vigorously uh, diff during different time periods. And we have just a snapshot of today's status. So when this copy and paste or cut and paste translocation events happen, you change the whole genetic background. You pull one gene from one place and put it in some other place. If you don't want it, you kill that gene, it becomes a pseudogene. If you use the real function for it, you keep it. Um, and, and, and then um, over time, you accumulate all the changes that randomly happened but that had a functional purpose or selected for a function for that uh, environment that remained. So uh, from a computational perspective, how hard is it to do the, the genomic jigsaw solving? Okay. So how, like what, what are the constraints and how does it change with the size of so it? So the genome uh, assembly becomes exponentially difficult if your genome is bigger. With the, so we've done uh, another genome that is twice the size of the genome that I talked about. And we could assemble that with, at the chromosome level. It was very successful the same way uh, this was. But it's still at the million base pair level. If you go to the billion giga base level, you're, you still can assemble anything but your assembly will be fragmented. You don't have the full thing from chromosome 1 to chromosome n. What you have is big pieces. And why is, uh, why is this? Because uh, most of the genomes, when you have bigger and bigger genomes, the genomes get bigger not because of genes, but because of repetitive elements. The more repetitive elements you have, it's really difficult to assemble them. Think, that, think about a jigsaw puzzle where all the pieces are the same shape and the same color. And you, instead of uh, one jigsaw puzzle, you start with 1,000 copies of the same picture. And all the, picture, all the pictures, the puzzle pieces are the same shape and the same size. And now when you want to get, put it back together, you don't know what the original was. In a real jigsaw puzzle, we start with a picture, but here we start with this white stuff. We don't know what the original APCG uh, sequence was. We can only assume what we get at the end is close to uh, reality as much as possible. So the more repeats you have, the, the computationally impossible with the lens we have. The only way to uh, cast this is overcome this is that if you have a machine that can sequence the uh, lengths that are longer than a repeat, so you have a continuous sequence. Right now, the natural repeat elements are much longer than the machines uh, are able to sequence at one stretch. But that is changing too. With Nanopore and PacBio platforms, things are, things are rapidly changing. Uh, so which camera works best? Uh, how do you decide uh, when you assemble genomes what the best camera to pick up? So camera, if, uh, the, uh, if the, the rest of you are wondering what that means, is that when you sequence genomes, uh, first when you get the sequence reads, you first cut it into a uniform size and then try to put it back together. So you further fragment it before you putting it together. Even if we complain about short reads, once we assemble it, we cut it further and then put it back. Uh, there are computational reasons for this, but uh, the best size to cut this, to assemble, depends on the species. So the best schema size is always species specific. Depends on the complexity of the, the organism. No one knows if it is not sequenced before. So, the strategy to, uh, to get uh, over that is to try a series of cameras 
and pick the best schema that would give you the lowest number of long pieces and the bigger, longest sequences. You have to go for N50 and the number of N50 uh, and get the best one with a series of schemas. But uh, no one knows that if you have really high coverage, so if you, instead of 1,000 copies of your genome, you sequence 2,000 copies. So if you the, the cover if you increase the coverage you can go for bigger cameras, but then it's not a linear relationship. Uh, so after a certain point, no matter how much you sequence, you can increase the quality of the assembly. You reach a plateau, and that's the intrinsic property of that species due to its natural complexity. All right, thanks very much. Thank you.